Hello once again, Cougar Nation. Welcome back inside Studio B at the BYU Broadcasting Building in Provo, Utah for our Week 9 edition of the Coordinator's Corner, presented by JCW's The Burger Boys. Coming up on today's show, we'll look back on Saturday's loss in Lynchburg, a third straight setback for the Cougs, who get back home this weekend to host ECU in a Friday night affair. And on today's show, we're chatting with BYU's Offensive Coordinator, Aaron Roderick, and Special Teams Coordinator, Ed Lamb. And we'll start the program with BYU OC and QB coach, Aaron Roderick. Aaron, good to have you back in. After a tough weekend, admittedly. Very tough. Yeah, it was very disappointing. Mm didn't see it coming no um, thought we had a I know we had a really good week of practice um, Jaron you know practiced all week and took all the reps and uh, you know and even though we had lost the game against Arkansas I thought we made some really good positive steps forward that week and felt like we were uh, you know trending in the right direction there in a lot of ways and um, was super disappointed in the way we, we played on Saturday we know what this game meant to Liberty. Um, how aware were you and your guys of the buildup from the other side for that game? Uh, we were aware. I mean, the whole team had seen had, the whole team had seen the video clip of Coach Freeze talking to his team about it being the biggest game in their school's history. Uh, our players knew the game was supposedly a sellout. It, it wasn't. The stadium wasn't full, and crowd noise was not a factor. But there was uh, good energy in the stadium, and their student section was was vocal and, uh, you know, giving our players a hard time right from pregame warm-ups. And so, there, there, you know, there, there should have been no excuse at all for us to not, you know, be excited to play and, and not, not to make a better showing. Yeah, there was no downplay, overlook no, factor. You absolutely. knew exactly what was on the on, – on, Yeah, on at, least, for them. at least from, you know, from our coaching staff standpoint, we, we did everything we could to make sure they knew this was a big deal. And I, I think our players understood that. I just – you know, there's uh, there are some issues that um, we've got to – we we got to get over. We're a little a little bit fragile right now, uh, confidence wise, and mm. we've, we've got to we've got to learn to handle adversity better. Let's get into the game and learn a bit about it. Uh, three and out to open the game for BYU on offense. You got the ball first, but your next possession, 76 yards and a touchdown, and the scoring play came on a third and 11. Yeah, yeah, third and 11. Uh, they they brought a, it was actually a quarterback draw. This this is a QB draw with an RPO. They brought a cover zero blitz and. Uh, uh, they had a coverage bust, nobody on Puka, and Jaron did a good job finding him. And then two great blocks in the perimeter, and Puka just does the rest. He's a he's a unbelievable in the open field. But, Find, finding the end zone with regularity these days is Puka. Yeah, great great play there by Jaron though to see the see it and not try to run the draw against Cover Zero. Defense got you the ball back after the uh, Puka touchdown. Only uh, only two plays later. Uh, and then you had a short field. But most of you, in fact, when that, when that uh, touchdown from Puka went in, uh, I think it was eight straight touchdown drives of 75 yards or long. You'd be having to go full field. You yeah. finally got a short field opportunity. Yeah, it was our first short field in a while, and um, it was good to get a touchdown. We, the, you know, that was uh, a play to Isaac that we've practiced. Oh, man, we've practiced this play so many times. Isaac scored on this exact play last year against Arizona State, and um, he, it was on the other side of the field. He, he scored this exact play. We've been practicing it for forever, and then the right time came up to call it. And uh, proud of how the guys executed that play. Is that a comfort play? Is that one you, when you feel like you, yeah, get, you just, get you get the right look? It'll be it'll be there for you. It's one of those plays that you you know it's just been repped so many times that um, it it has a good chance to succeed. What do you remember feeling getting up 14-3 early? Felt like we were going to score 14 every quarter. I mean that's really what what I thought what I thought the game was going to go like. Um, and you know it was nice to get off to a fast start and. Unfortunately, uh, after that point, we didn't play very well. You were leading 14-10 because uh, defense held to a field goal. You're leading 14-10. You got a big puka play to set you up at midfield. A third and 10, you got four to the Liberty 47. Often in the middle of the field, you're going to be aggressive on fourth down. Uh, it was a fourth and six. You decided to punt there. Yeah, and that, that was normally that's one where we would go for it. Um, we decided to punt. It's not. I don't make the decision whether we punt or not. I'm just ready. I'm just ready with the play call on, uh, you know, for those fourth downs if, if we decide to go. Okay. Uh, Liberty's next drive gave the Flames a lead. They would not relinquish it. Um, next drive you do trail. You get to the 39 this time. It's a fourth and nine. This time you do go. Um, and yeah, uh, the, the turning point in that game to me was that, that possession. We had second and two um, at the 30. I'm not sure. Second and two, though, right, right you know, and, and – um, we ran an inside zone play that we we did not execute the play well at all um, by 
a couple of players, lost a yard, no big deal. It's still third and three, and we have two downs to get it because uh, it was it was a go. The the analytics were it was a go hmm. at fourth and nine or less, and so we were already at third and three. So we know we're, we know we have two downs to get it. We ran jet sweep to Puka that we averaged 14 yards of carry on that play, and uh, we had a two missed assignments on that play that we didn't execute the play, lost eight yards, knocked us back to fourth and nine. Then we went for it on fourth and nine and had an open receiver and just did not complete the ball. That was the one to chase, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the chase. We didn't complete the ball. So th those three plays were really, really poor uh, by our, our team. I was disappointed in that. And then the problem there was then we gave, and so there was three minutes left in the half when it was second and two. And we gave them the ball back. They went down and got a field goal, went up by six, which again, no big deal. But then they get the ball first. In it was the a middle-eight situation there. You could have kept it going, had you. Get a right, touchdown. Yeah. So the next time we touch the ball is middle of the third quarter, and now we're down by two scores. And in real time, it had been a long time for your offense. Yes. Roughly. And, uh, again, the, no excuses. That's, yeah. that's the part. That's the adversity that we have to handle better. We, we, I didn't feel like we handled that well at all. Uh, obviously, we didn't handle it well at all, and, and uh, it's something that we have to fix. You mentioned them going up six. You were down 2014 at halftime, but it's a one-score game. Right. Um, what, if any, adjustments were you thinking you were going to be able to make at halftime to get it back and rolling in the second half? Well, it really didn't feel like we needed to make a lot of adjustments. It wasn't like we were terrible in that first half. We had some good things going. We shot ourselves in the foot, but we were moving the ball, and things we were doing were working. Um, but where the game changed was then we got the ball back. Now we're down two scores. I think we have a, you know, there's a little bit of uh, a fragile mindset right now where guys are maybe, you know, starting to count how many possessions we have left and how many scores we're down. And, and instead of just thinking about this play right now, I've got to execute this play and then play the next play. You can't, you can't look that far ahead. Um, but then two scores became three scores and then we just completely imploded. We were, we were pressing, trying to do too much. You know, there's no, there's no 14 point touchdown there's no 21 point touchdown you have to you just have to get one play at a time drive the ball down and get a touchdown and then you reevaluate on your next possession and we uh, I thought we were pressing and trying to get it all back right away and and it's just uh, we've, we've got to be we've got to be mentally tougher how do you get that sense you're separated from your team how do you sense that that's actually happening as it's happening? Uh, some of it's just feedback I'm getting from the quarterback or from coaches on the sideline, and then some of that's from conversations I've had with our team over the weekend. Um, and, you know, it, it's disappointing because uh, this is the same group of players who have thrived in adversity in the past. I mean, this is it's not, it's the same, same guys. Mm -hmm. now we've, we've been in these tough situations before and played at our absolute best when the chips are down and, and, you know, everything's against us. And um, for whatever reason, we, we have not done that well enough uh, lately. And so we have to, we got to fix that. Okay, we're uh, taking a break on the coordinator's corner. As we step away, we remind you that BYU football with Kalani Sitake airs tomorrow night, every Tuesday night at 6.30 Mountain Time on the BYU TV app. You can also hear it on BYU Radio. We have a live studio audience. I'll post the seat request link on my Twitter feed today, and you can hit that. Then we'll see you down the hall in studio C tomorrow night. Coming up after the break, how things got away a bit from BYU in the second half back east, and we'll get an offensive player of the week. The coordinator's corner brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. More with A-Rod after this. Deep, deep drop for Hall. Loads up and fires to a wide open Isaac Rex. And Rex makes the catch for the touchdown. Left side of the end zone. It's BYU 13 and Liberty 3 with the PAT pending. There's a short field score for BYU. Didn't take long. And the Cougs are right back in the end zone. All right, that was early in Lynchburg on Saturday afternoon. BYU now 4-4 four and four on the season after a third straight loss this past Saturday at Liberty. A Flames win at 41-14. to 14. Uh, Liberty improving to 7-1 and one on the season, picking up top 25 votes. So this weekend, it's BYU home to ECU Friday night at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. BYU's won its last 14 home night games. Uh, Coordinator's Corner continues now with BYU offensive coordinator and QB coach Aaron Roderick. Uh, Liberty outscored BYU 10-0 uh, in the middle eight. Uh, they opened the second half with a, with a touchdown. So you're down the two scores now you talked about, 27 to 14. The next drive you had on Saturday started with a really nice gain, third and 20, Jaron gains nine, and then you have, again, another fourth down and kind of intermediate call at midfield. It was a punt. You would have hoped to get a punt and pin. Turned out to be a touchback. Didn't gain as much as you'd like to there. Yeah, and we shot ourselves in the foot before we got to third and 20 there. It was, um, you know, an unforced error by, by our team that, we, you know, we should have never been in that situation in the first place. But, 
yeah, that, that middle part of the game was really uh, discouraging, you know, just the way it turned on us so quickly. And uh, the, the thing that was just most disappointing to me was just our lack of, of, of uh, our, our inability to just battle through that adversity. I, the game was not out of hand yet, and, uh, but we, our execution got worse in that part of the game, and we did, we did not do our part. Started to feel a bit out of hand after the next play, which was an 80-yard touchdown run from Liberty. Now all the momentum, and it's now a 20-point game. And then what came next was a three and out, I think. And at that point, it kind of felt, wow, the air is a bit out of this team right now. It was. It was. And we have to be honest with ourselves about that. It, that's what happened, and we, uh, we have to own it. And we've got to bounce back. We, we have to be more resilient and be tougher. There was a fumble recovery from BYU uh, soon thereafter, still in the third. Um, and, and you got to the Liberty 47. It's a fourth and 12. Now it's, I mean, you have to go at this point. Yep. You don't convert. Uh, Liberty goes up on the next drive, 41 to 14, and it kind of felt like that was it. What were you, when, when you did get the fumble recovery, did you see what you wanted to see from your guys in terms of, okay, we're kind of still in this thing? Um, I thought that we, you know, <laughs> I don't know. When that situation came up, I thought, okay, here we go. Let's just get a touchdown and, you know, just get some momentum, get something going. And, and um, we didn't respond well at all. And, and so, you know, and that's, I'm responsible for that. I take responsibility for it. I've never, I've never hidden from, from anything like that. i um, been, been in tough situations before, and we will, we will battle back. We'll get our team going and be, be more competitive this week. Does this feel like anything you've been through before in specifics? Uh, yeah, I've, I mean, I've been through some other tough times in my coaching career where, you know, a team is sort of uh, struggling and in a little bit of a slump. And, and usually, you know, most, most of those things that just have to do with confidence. I mean, these are, these are college, college age guys. They're, you know, they're big, you know, tough, whatever looking dudes. But every one of them just, they still have their own confidence issues just like the rest of us. And, and um, they still have the same insecurities and, and the same, you know, personality things that we all have to work through in our lives and so now it's just getting our players back together we have to have a tougher more resilient mindset and then we also have to have to have more confidence in ourselves that you know we can execute our plays and get back on track because it was just you know it wasn't that long ago that we were going up and down the field against an SEC team and scoring points and with the same plays the same it's the same scheme it's not this game was not about scheme this game I want to make that clear this game had nothing to do with scheme this play had to do with our mindset and our uh, ability to handle adversity. Mm. Uh, a few notes coming out of the game. No Chris Brooks in the second half, I don't think. Got dinged, it seemed, late in the first. I might have seen him with a wrap on his lower yeah. on, on his leg. Um, status on Chris right uh, now? He has a hamstring situation, and he'll be questionable this week. Okay. After a fast first quarter, uh, and Jaron had a great first quarter, he kind of, you know, yeah. the, I guess he kind of mirrored the team in a lot of ways, but it ended up being, like, statistically his worst start at BYU. Yeah, it was not a good game for him. He knows it, um, and uh, he, feels, he feels badly about it. He's uh, very accountable, and, um, you know, we, we met this morning and talked, talked a lot yesterday, and I expect I – know, I know Jaron's competitor. I know what he's made of, and I know that he will bounce back this week, and he'll give – He'll give our team everything he has this week. I know he will, and uh, I feel like he, he prepared well last week. He just didn't have didn't have his best game, and, and um, but I have a lot of confidence in what Jaron Hall is all about, and he'll bounce back. Those 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 conversations, coach, player, or private. And we're not asking you to take us into that room, but when you do leave a room or have conversations, text or phone calls with Jaron, what are you left with after this? Like like what impressed you most about what you got back and feedback from him? Well, you know, Kalani always talks about feedback's a gift, and you need to, you know, we, we in our program, it's about being receptive to coaching and criticism and, and being open to that and knowing that if, if I take the criticism or the coaching the right way, that I can, it's a gift that I can use to improve. And Jaron's always been very accountable. He, he wants to be coached. Uh, he's not defensive at all. And I'm the same way. I'm, I'm open to that, and I let him say what he needs to say to me. I'm the same way with our coaching staff. And I feel like that's the, you know, that's why I have a lot of confidence that we can bounce back from this. Uh, it's another game where you don't snap a lot of plays. You had 50 yeah. snaps on Saturday. Uh, Liberty had as many, almost many rushing plays, 48, as BYU had offensive plays for the game. You've had a few of these now where the, the balance is just a little off that way. Yeah, it's been, it's been that way and for a bit now. And um, I think that's one of the issues we have to overcome as an offense is we cannot be counting possessions and counting plays. We just have to play the next play. And 
take it one play at a time, play the next play, and not uh, think about what the score is or how many possessions we have left or how many we were likely to get or not get. Mm. There's, there's, uh, I think that's something that has entered our players' minds at times, and we cannot allow that to happen. It's, it's just, it's, there's, there's nothing mm. good that comes from that. It's just, uh, it's, you know, you're overthinking things instead of just playing the play right now. Play this play call against this defense that's in front of you and execute the play. And then whatever the result of that play is, you play the next play. And it sounds like cliche, but that is the only way out of this situation that we're in. Different styles of play and different uh, builds of teams lend different weight to possession time. For certain teams, possession time means a lot. For certain teams, like, hey, let's just go. We don't really need it a long time to score. What's this current BYU's team's value on possession time, do you think? Well, that's one area. Of, it's been it's been an area of, of uh, it's been an area of deficiency in our team this year. Is where our com- our complementary style of play that has been part of our winning formula in the past has been a little bit out of whack in this losing streak, and we know it. And everybody's it's not a secret. We you know we're our our defense is having a tough time getting off the field, and we haven't done a good enough job uh, in the Notre Dame game and in this game of staying on the field. And uh, I thought we did a good job in the Arkansas game, but um, you know, we, that's part of the formula. We're not necessarily out to win the time of possession every week. That's not, a, that's not a goal of ours. But we don't want the, it to be so out of whack that one side of the field is, you know, we're not complementing each other with the way we play. And so, um, you know, we've, we've always been a team we can strike fast and score in a hurry. Or we also have been a team that we can grind the clock and take five, six minutes off the clock and hand the ball to our running backs and run wide zone down the field. And uh, that, the little bit of that is missing right now. And um, so we have to just get back to basics this week. Yeah, and during the three-game slide right now, it is way out of whack, right? It's 37 to 23 in minutes. A 14-minute differential game by game is, is a lot. Yeah, you know, we, we had a couple of drives in the third quarter of the Arkansas game where it felt like, you know, like, First quarter, we had some drives where we were just throwing it and moving down the field in a hurry and scoring in a hurry. And then we had two drives in the third quarter. There were 10 plays, five minutes off the clock, 75 yards where we mostly ran it. And we ate some time up and got two touchdowns out of it. And um, that's who we want to be on offense, a team that can get you either way Mm -hmm. and a team that can have answers. But um, the complementary style of play is sort of out of whack right now with – you know, the way that game went Saturday. And then once we got down a couple scores, again, uh, you got to throw it to stay in it. And so now you sort of lose that balance that you're looking for of run and pass and using all your weapons, and it just turns into a drop-back pass fest. It's never just one side of the ball when, you, yeah. when you're talking about this, this particular stat. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and now if we're in a situation where we can run the ball and do everything we want to do offensively, then the other thing that does is it gives your defense a chance to rest. And so those – those things are, are uh, you know, that's been something that has been out of whack for, you know, the character of our team the last two, three seasons where we're winning 11 and 10 games. Usually it's because we're playing very good complementary football. And uh, in this three-game streak, that's not been the case. If there were one thing you'd want to see done better offensively against ECU, uh, what might it be? Well, I, I just would have liked to have seen us, you know, when we had that second and two. I mean, I, I, I usually, I rarely, I, I, I'd rarely uh, point to a play or a turning point in a game. I, I think that the game, in every game, you can't ever just say the game was made or, you know, made or broken on this, on this one play. I don't usually do that. But I do feel like that was a big turning point in the game where we had second and two, um, did not execute. Then back-to-back lost yardage. Got to fourth and long, couldn't make the play. Then they flipped that on us with two scores in that middle eight, and the game really turned there. And I I, I wish, um, you know, I I would love to have that situation back. We didn't didn't get it done. I'm responsible for it and and, um, working to fix it this week. Okay, uh, Offensive Player of the Week. Uh, there was uh, a standout uh, from Saturday, and really since he's gotten back to what we'll call full health, even though he went out a couple times Saturday, uh, he's been tremendous, and that's Puka Nakua. Yeah, Puka uh, played a good game. Uh, he brings so much energy and toughness to our team, and uh, playmaking, obviously, just there's trying to get him the ball as many ways as we can, and um, love what he's doing for our team, and love his attitude, and uh, really appreciate everything he's doing. And he plays a fast and physical style, and he did come out a couple times, but came back in every time. I think he's yeah. okay, right? Yeah, he's getting in better shape. He's still not all the way where we need him to be, but um, you know, we we tried to get him the ball 
as much as we could. And that it'll be that way, that, you know, as long as he's available, we'll always try to get him the ball as much as possible. I think it was Jaron who said uh, Puka might have been one of the guys to maybe talk first in the locker room after the game just to, you know, get some feelings out and make sure some guys are on the same page. Uh, has he become that kind of player for this team, uh, vocal leader he that gave, way? He gave a very uh, impassioned speech right after the game, which, you know, usually uh, right after the game, everybody's emotional, players, coaches, fans, you know, and we all have really strong opinions right after the game. Usually it's, you know, uh, better to let, some time go by before you speak your mind. Uh, but I thought that Puka, I'm not going to go into what he said, but he said all the right things. It was, it was, uh, he handled the moment very well. And um, to be honest, when he first started talking, I was like, oh boy. Uh, and I thought he, I thought he did an excellent job. Everything he said, I thought was well received by our whole team. And um, I think if we apply a lot of things he was talking about mm -hmm. this week to our practices that, um, we'll have a great chance on Friday night. And I want to revisit one point you said before the break. You mentioned the word adversity a couple times. You're in it right now. Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, you know, nobody expected to be in this situation that we're in right now, but that's football and that's life. And, and um, you know, we have to bow up and, and take this head on. You can't, you can't hide from it and you can't blame anybody else. You got to take, take accountability for it. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid of this moment, and I, I don't think our players are either. We'll... We'll show up Friday night and be ready to play. Look forward to the response on Friday. Uh, time for a break, and as we take this time out, a reminder that uh, dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality, and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and Harriman. This weekend, BYU hosting the Pirates of East Carolina. It's a Friday night game at Lavelle Edwards Stadium, and we invite you to tune in for Cougar pregame live on BYU Radio. 6 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Mountain Time, the kick at 8 Eastern, 6 Mountain Friday night. Coming up next, some closing comments with BYU Offensive Coordinator Aaron Roderick. The Coordinator's Corner continues right after this. We're brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Bennett settles in the pocket and throws high, incomplete, and intercepted. Talon Alfrey makes the interception for BYU. Alfrey inside the 30-yard line, and it's Cougars first down and 10. That is giveaway number 17 on the year for Liberty. All right, so you're in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's. The Burger Boys visiting with BYU offensive coordinator Aaron Roderick. Coach Roderick and the 4-4 four four Cougs hosting 5-3 ECU Friday night at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. A third meeting all-time. Uh, each team has won a home game, uh, BYU in 2015, ECU in 2017. Some early thoughts on East Carolina that comes in off a really nice win, big win over UCF on the weekend. Yeah, they got four, took four takeaways uh, against UCF's offense. Um, they are uh, playing with a lot of swagger. You can see it on film. They, they play with enthusiasm. They're flying around. Um, it's a complicated defense. They, do a, they blitz from every angle and play a lot of different coverages. And um, huge challenge, huge challenge. BYU's uh, lost three straight. ECU comes in having won three of four. And again, a big right. Like they, they consider UCF a big-time rivalry game for them, and that was yeah. a big win for them on the weekend. And, uh, you know, you're not going to worry so much about their offense, but they can certainly uh, put some points up as well. I mean, this has, you know, the potential for a shootout uh, on the weekend. Yeah, I mean, the other team's offense is a factor. You know, you've got to score more points than the other team, so we have to be ready to play. You know, we're going against their defense, which is uh, it's, it's a good defense. They odd front with a lot of uh, blitzing diversity. They bring guys from all different angles. They blitz a lot of secondary players. You're going to get corner blitzes, safety blitzes. They come from everywhere, and um, it's we have to be squared away. They, they're very good. So disruptive is a good word to describe their defense? Disruptive, yeah. I would say uh, it's, it's got some rocky long elements to it. 3-3-5-ish? Um, 3-3-5-ish. Three, three, five three, three, five yeah. there's, there's some of that stuff, yeah. Um, and just most of all, you just see how physical they are and how much fun they have playing. They fly around and, and get after it. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I didn't ask you about uh, Gunnar Romney earlier. He was on the trip but didn't play this past weekend. Is he close to maybe making another appearance for you? I was told this morning that uh, they expect him to play, but it's, it still depends on how he does in practice this week. But I was told this morning we're expecting to have him. And not a true typical short week, but shorter week. It's Friday night game. Yeah, yeah, um, shorter week for sure. I mean, that's a full day. Is full day is a lot in in this business. Uh, they have to travel out here, so they're at a disadvantage. Uh, I guess you could say a little bit with the travel, but um, shorter week. It, you know, it's uh, not a time to get complicated. It's just about 
fundamentals and technique and being more competitive, being tougher in, you know, adverse situations. Regardless of the outcome of the game, were you impressed by what Liberty showed you in terms of a program and a venue and, and just kind of the way the team was received out there on, on the weekend? Oh, yeah, I had I had uh, full respect for them. I, already, I knew they were a good team. I was not surprised at all about how they played. And I've seen them on film. They're 6-1 they're and one for a reason and 7-1 and one now. Um, they've recruited very well there. It's a beautiful place with great facilities. You can tell that football is very important yeah, at the university. That's the vibe I got, they, absolutely. They want to be a big-time college football program. And it showed in everything about the whole place. And um, so I was not surprised at all. Okay, we're not going to see it for a couple of weeks. Uh, maybe you could uh, characterize what maybe team goals and mindset will be uh, heading down the stretch here at 4-4. Four and four. Well, we're just treating this game as a one-game season. I mean, right now we're not – there's no need to look back or look farther ahead than Friday night. And, you know, one play at a time in practice this week. Um, and – one game Friday night and find a way to win that game by one more point than the other team if that's what it takes. And we don't care if it's a low scoring you know, grinder or if it's a shootout. Uh, we just have to find a way to make this a one game season and get a win Friday night. That's all that matters. Okay. Always appreciate your perspective, Aaron. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. That is BYU offensive coordinator Aaron Roderick. Get expanded pregame coverage of BYU's game against ECU this Friday night with BYU TV's BYU Sports Nation game day starting at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Coming up next, we'll hear from BYU special teams coordinator Ed Lamb. This is the coordinator's corner coming to you live from Studio B at BYU TV. We're brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Coach Lamb is coming up right after this. Back in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. BYU now 4-4 four and four on the season after Saturday's 41-14 loss at Liberty. Cougs look at a stop, a three-game skid this Friday night. Home to ECU, the Pirates 5-3. and three. And coming off a home win over conference rival UCF on the weekend. We begin the second half of today's show with BYU's special teams coordinator, safeties coach, and assistant head coach, Ed Lamb. Coach Lamb, welcome back in. Thanks, Greg. Well, Liberty uh, called it the uh, biggest game in our home game in program history, uh, a game 50 years in the making, fulfillment of a vision. A lot went into it from them. Uh, what did the game mean, do you think, to your guys going in and going back to Lynchburg? Oh, certainly not as much as it, as it meant to them. And that, I mean, that those types of things are extrinsic motivation, and that's, you know, that's, that's fine and it's real. And they had that. Uh, we didn't have that. And, and we were you know, playing on the road, and I think we're – a little bit uh, confident shaken uh, going into the game and still are and haven't got that corrected yet. And that's, um, that's priority number one. Kind of a trivial thing that Liberty likes to note, but uh, teams that have traveled more than a thousand miles to play in Lynchburg are now a combined one and eight all time. Now, circumstances differ in terms of teams and losses, but what is the real effect actually of having to travel to the East Coast to play like you did last week? Yeah, you know, the, the as college coaches, we often look at the NFL because it's so common to travel uh, coast to coast, and, and there's a big advantage to playing at home uh, when you've got a team traveling the other way. It's, it's particularly difficult, um, you know, from, from an NFL data standpoint to travel from west to east. So that is a little bit more of a challenge, but we've done it before. We've been successful before, and it's not. Won a game this year in Tampa. Exactly. Look good a, off the not start. A reason to uh, to point to to a loss. I don't know how many points it's worth, but it's not worth 40 points. Kalani said he called all the defensive plays at Liberty and wanted to simplify BYU's defensive approach. How did that show up in the week of practice, maybe leading up to that game? Uh, well, it showed up right at the beginning of the week with uh, Coach Tuiaki uh, explaining to the players that um, you know we we as coaches have to hold ourselves accountable just like we hold you guys accountable. And if we're not getting the job done in the role that we're in, then change is in order. And I thought that was a great message for him to send. Um, you know, Kalani followed that up and with you know the the idea that right reminding the players that look our, our playbook has everything that we've all known as a coaching staff um for forever and uh, we've got we've got all the blitzes we've got all the zones we've got all the mans i'm not going to do anything new but i'm going to bring a new lens and i'm going to bring my lens and, and i've been successful and here's what we're going to work with this week and simplification a uh, focus on execution and uh, you know i thought it was the right message and the right plan um it didn't work. How, how does defense look generally through Kalani's lens, maybe, uh, knowing him as you do, philosoph philosophically and that kind of thing? Yeah, I, well, I think right now we're really focused on um, 
you know, and, and he and I's conversations and the way that things have shaped over the years and the way this team is shaping up, we're focused on execution and confidence and the relationship between those two things. Uh, I think um, even feedback that he's getting from the players, I think there's a lot of our players that are listening to outside voices, and, um, and that is pretty common when, uh, when you're struggling, is everybody's searching for answers. And I think, I think our guys are mature. We've won a lot of games with these same players, and so I think they're mature in the way that they, they really want to look at how they can get better individually and as a team. But it's somewhat natural, I think, to look outside and, and be influenced by outside voices in a time of weakness. So Kalani notes this change last week, and there was a logistical uh, element to it. Uh, Coach Tuiaki came down to the field, right? And, yes. and I think Preston Hadley went up. Right. Um, having E down there, what was the intended effect of having him you know, closer to the action there that way? And well, it was guys, maybe. Yeah, I mean, Coach Tuiaki, is, he's, he's well known as a, as a very good um, sound fundamental defensive line coach and also the energy the passion that he brings into that role uh, can be a lot different I mean calling a game takes every single moment of the game and uh, and so Kalani moving into that role freed up E to be more of a voice to the defensive line in between series that's the idea it didn't work exactly how we planned exactly how we want but uh, you know I think Considering with what Kalani's doing now, uh, that's where Elisa belongs. And is that, uh, are we kind of in status quo for the time being in terms of how things are operating right now, operationally? I, 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 think, um, I think so. We want to, you know, the changes that were, were made last week, I, th I think were appropriate. And, um, and, and Coach Tuiaki uh, said those words as well. I think, I think they were appropriate for that time. And I think that uh, moving forward, one of the biggest things we have to do as, as a coaching staff is regardless of what's being said outside, we have to be a model of consistency for our mm -hmm. players and a model of confidence, showing confidence in what our players are, are capable of doing. And so the answer to your question is yes, we believe that, that right now we, we haven't decided to change any of that dynamic you're talking about um, moving forward. We want to be as consistent as we can from last week to this week, stick with what we believe, and uh, we challenge the players to execute better. We talked about D-line a minute ago with E and, and, and coaching the position group, and interestingly, they've been banged up enough that uh, a couple of O-linemen uh, went over to the D-line last week. Uh, Tyler Little, uh, Sonny Maccasini uh, both came over. Those kinds of changes that happen midstream, how, I mean, what's the weight of that decision for those players and, and the team in general when you make those kind of calls? You know, it puts a little bit of a load on the, on the veteran D linemen. We had to put those offensive linemen in with the, with the veteran defensive linemen next to them, and uh, they have to kind of uh, review the assignments. I think being able to pass a, a written test or a verbal test, that's pretty easy. We don't, we're, not, we're not so complex that uh, a guy can't learn it in a week. But um, doing it at live speed, live tempo, and then with adjustments that are required as the offense comes out in different formations and things like that, there was some communication that needed to go on. Uh, we thought that uh, it was going to be a move where we wanted to see the potential, and the potential is there. So. So is it maybe a keeper, at least uh, for Absolutely. the time being? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're not going to get into a play-by-play -play of this one at all, but uh, the Liberty game itself. Uh, start of the game was good enough. Uh, you hold Liberty to a field goal. on their. They had a first and goal from the eight, and it's an early hold. Uh, offense gets a TD. You get a takeaway. Offense gets a TD. You're up 14 to three. Yeah. It was a great start, actually. It was. Um, a, you know, we talk about uh, as coaches during the game what kind of things are sustainable and what kind of, of things are are not sustainable. And, and interceptions and then and then the big play by Puka, uh, while they're exciting and, and uh, incredible plays, uh, they, they maybe they aren't usually sustainable. It's hard to rip off 70 plus yard plays over and over. It's hard to get interceptions over and over. And uh, you know, I felt like that our players needed to still press in that moment, and uh, and, and maybe we relaxed a little bit. Uh, it certainly showed up in our play. Um, we, I thought we could have played harder in that moment and really pressed for a bigger lead. Yeah, on that sense, that's so overconfidence or over satisfaction, early 11-point lead. Do you, I mean, looking back on or even in the moment, you go, there's some, there's some let up there. It's just, it's really hard. Or is it just human right? nature? As you can imagine. It, it, it is human nature, and uh, and I think. You know, looking deep inside myself, it's like, oh, okay, are we are we on here today? Are we are we finding that fast start that's been elusive for us? And so I think I'm I'm as much to blame as anyone. And then the other side of that is it's really hard to paint with a broad brush and say the whole team relaxed in that moment and everybody got overconfident. You know, that would that would be impossible to 
to determine. But but uh, bottom line is we, we did get the start fast and we didn't follow it up. Okay, uh, there was an early key decision in the game uh, with BYU still leading 14-10. It was a fourth and seven at the Liberty 47. And we've seen enough BYU football lately to know that that's, that, that's usually go to, or can be go territory for you. Uh, you end up gaining just 27 yards on the punt. The decision was to kick. Yeah. Um, we've seen BYU be aggressive in the past in that part of the field. Do you remember the conversation at that moment? Was still, you were leading at that point. Yeah, um, it really comes down to like feeling like um, our confidence level in the play at that moment to get to get that yardage. The the decision, so to speak, at least the preliminary decision, is already made. It, we we follow an, an analytics book that tells us our, the percentage of time that we're going to convert on fourth and seven. Um, it it basically goes off of a national average plus or minus a few percentage points based on how well we're playing and the defense that we're going against. And so that decision's already made. It was a go decision, but it was close enough where Kalani can decide, you know, let's let's try to pin them and, and play defense. We didn't get the pin, right? And so it made it the wrong decision. Liberty got the ball, took a lead. They would not give up. Um, and again, you get to a halftime uh, down six with very little offensive possession time and few plays run, relatively speaking. And again, as Aaron said, it's a complimentary football thing. It's not just the offense not staying on the field. It's the defense also not getting off the field. And again, you had that big play disparity at halftime. Yeah, huge, huge play disparity. That's one of the problems with, uh, if there is a problem with scoring quickly, that's one of the problems is the defense comes right back out and, and you have to follow up a quick score by your own team with, uh, with a, a quick stop uh, in order to, to save momentum. and. We weren't able to sustain that. If you take away Liberty's, um, their one two-play possession when they had the pick from Talon, their first five drives averaged 11 plays and 70-plus yards. And that's kind of been a theme during the current little slide right now is, is the long, time-consuming drives that do end with scores. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're, it's a mix of different things. At, at times it's tackling, at times it's execution, and um, I think showing up together at different times is, uh, has been the, the problem for us. But as I mentioned with Coach A-Rod, it was a one-score game at halftime. 20-14 to 14 is not the end of the world. Um, no one knew the BYU would not score again, but at 2014, you felt, oh, well, how did you feel? You know, well, we, I, we felt like there were things to correct at halftime, and that's typically where, where I'm at mentally is looking at the, um, the strategic, the schematic, elements that we need to get fixed right away. Kalani is typically going to look at things like where is our team at mentally and uh, and he has to address that and kind of give the, the right words, the right combination of words to go out and have the right mental mindset for the next half. I thought that uh, I, I thought that he nailed it at halftime which is like we're in a dog fight, we're at, we're at an opponent's biggest game and uh, and they're right in it and so they're going to believe they can win and we got to come out and take it from them. We have to battle. What did you think, meantime, schematically, tactically needed to happen differently in the second half that didn't? Yeah, I thought in the first half we, uh, we lost some, some man-to-man battles. Uh, we really want to be uh, a team that can identify as playing man-to-man. That we will continue to recruit towards that. I think we have the defensive backs toward that. We weren't quite getting the pass rush to, uh, to help that, those man-to-man battles. And um, you know, on, on uh, a few occasions there, even on the first drive, we lost some one-on-one battles on the perimeter that were called back for um, offensive linemen too far downfield. Yep. But it really didn't have anything to do with that one-on-one battle outside. The, the linemen downfield gave them no advantage for that. We were kind of fortunate to get out of that. And so I felt like we needed to, we needed to just make sure and give our guys a nice combination of, of zone coverages uh, with, the, with the pressures and with the man coverage and, and you know, yeah. again, it didn't work. How important are sacks going to be to this team, do you think, moving forward and getting done what you want to get done defensively? Uh, sacks are critical, and, uh, and, and both types of sacks. We've got to get, we've got to get pressure sacks, which is, which is five plus on the rush, and then we've got to get coverage sacks, which is, which is four or, or even less on the rush. And, uh, and those things work hand, hand in hand. And we, those, putting the offense behind schedule, behind the chains, is the key to getting off the field and getting off the field quickly in good field position. And that's where we've been failing. Yeah, we may get to this in the next segment, but uh, the third and shorts, and there were a lot of them for Liberty, are all a function of, of the first and, down, first and second down plays. There aren't enough negative ones of those. Too much is being gained early to, to make it more manageable late for them in their, in their drives. That's right. All right, we'll take a break. As I said, we had to break. A reminder to watch after further review tomorrow at 7 Eastern time on the BYU TV app as Dave McCann, Blaine Fowler, and David Nixon break down last week's game. When we come back, more with BYU Special Teams Coordinator Ed Lamb. As the Coordinator's Corner continues, we're brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. Back with more after this. The give is Shedro, and Shedro on third down and nine. Oh. Ball loose, and the Kooks have the takeaway they needed. 
The ball is stripped and the Cougars recover at the 40 yard line. All right, uh, we are back on the coordinator's corner chatting with BYU special teams coordinator, safeties coach, and assistant head coach Ed Lamb. Cougars coming into the week at 4-4 four and four on the year after Saturday afternoon's 41-14 setback at Liberty. Another uh, tough third down day for the BYU defense, uh, Coach. Uh, Liberty converted 7 of 12. Over the last three games, the number's at around 70% on third down defense. Um, factors going into that? Yeah, you alluded to it. Uh, you know, the National average on third and one for conversions would be around you know the low 80s, high 70 percent, and third and two is still still very high. So it's it's really about creating more third and longs. We've had some third and longs that we've let uh, teams off the hook too, and so the, so the, those aren't automatic outs, but uh, certainly our our odds of getting off the field more often. So we don't really look at you know to, to us third down conversion percentage is a little bit of a simplistic stat to look at. Okay, what are we calling on third down? We want to look at are we getting the stuff rate that we need on first and second down in order to create the third and longs and then within that what's our third and long um, you know conversion or stop percentage according to down and but when you see a third and 4.7 that's just that, that that's not where you want to be that's right exactly yeah. uh, that's that's a third and third and five is where again looking at a national average you go over 50 percent as an offense on on uh, third and five or less so we need it we need it to be more than that we talk to our players about third and six plus Every defense wants to be disruptive. That's a word that gets used a lot. Havoc is also a word that gets used a lot with defense. Um, is BYU making enough, quote-unquote, plays on the ball to be disruptive or create enough havoc the way you view what the responsibilities are for a defense? No, no, absolutely not. We need, uh, we need more takeaways. We need, we need more stops of, of any type at this point, and uh, I think execution um, is always a big part of that. It's, I know it's hard to see on television, really, like, um, for example, interceptions that never happen, that should have happened had guys been in the right place or had their eyes in the right place. We can be more disruptive, get more tips, get more overthrows created with a more frontal position. I thought our defensive line got vertical up the field very aggressively in response to some things we were trying to do this week defensively, but we didn't stay frontal on the quarterback. And mm. so they become rushes of no worth when we're just kind of running up the field and letting the quarterback step up through the middle. That's an area we've really got to get better at if we're going to be a, a more aggressive uh, um, four and five man rush. You'll take takeaways wherever they come and from whomever they come, but uh, all the interceptions were linebacker picks until the weekend. You got your first secondary interception, and uh, Talon Alfrey gets his first career interception. Yeah, it was a really nice job by, uh, by Max Tooley getting underneath the bender route first. He's the boundary linebacker there. He comes in the screen late, and he just put a little more air under it than the, than the quarterback would have liked. And uh, Talon you know, did a good job of, of collecting the, the fairly straightforward interception. At that point, it's about ball security, getting up the near sideline, using the available blockers, and then, and then maintaining possession because it's, it's kind of strange to all of a sudden be carrying the football when you don't mm -hmm. do that time after time. The game kind of broke in the second half on an 80-yard touchdown run from Day-Day Hunter. And for a smaller back, uh, he was outstanding. Uh, 23 carries, 213 yards, and a score, the long, the long gainer being that 80-yard scamper. Yeah, he had an outstanding game. He, was, he, ran, he ran very active. He broke tackles. He saw the holes really well uh, right there he breaks a tackle and then uh, right here we get an angle on him and uh, not able to bring him down he timed it up perfectly and, and we launched left our feet which which uh, you know the guys are trained not to do but uh, in that moment we've, we failed to execute it correctly he took a lot of hits had a lot of work and played a really good game for them they have to be happy with how he's performing uh, on the day BYU gives up around 300 the round number is 300 yards exactly on the ground it's really tough to win with that number if a team's running it that effectively and that frequently yeah absolutely yeah. unless you're playing a triple option team and hold them to you know 18 yards past yeah. 300 yards rushing you're just never gonna win a game uh, special teams report on Saturday how to come out um, well, was, uh, we didn't get a chance to kick a field goal. I'm really anxious for, for Jake. I, I talked to the team on, um, on game day morning and, and let them know that Jake ha has our highest potential as a kicker. We've all seen him, uh, seen him on top of his game, and, and when he does that, he's one of the best in the country and an NFL prospect, and we were going to stick with him um, uh, through, this, through this slump, and I thought that the team did a great job of responding to that. He came in and, and uh, kicked his two field goals. The, uh, for for several games in a row now, they you know the the punt and the kickoff coverage and, and the return games have been solid. Um, didn't make any game changing plays um, in the special teams and obviously with, on the road like that and and uh, with a point deficit, uh, those those kinds of things would be huge and we weren't able to create that big return or blocked punt or something along those lines. A lot of this is situational, but uh, BYU's not attempted a field goal 
over the last three games. Uh, first time since you've been a coach here that BYU's got a three-game span without a field goal try, not even a make, but a try. In fact, it's been eight years since BYU's had this kind of stretch. But again, so how much how much it is, you're not getting deep enough to try it. Right. And how much was a little bit, maybe the last couple games, let's go for touchdowns first and see if we can really make that the approach. Yeah, certainly in the Arkansas game and the Liberty game in the second half, um, there would have been some field goal um, opportunities had the, cl- had the score been closer, closer but, yeah. uh, but it wasn't in the last two games. Uh, and in the Notre Dame game, we just didn't advance to that end of the field very often. It's, it's certainly not, we're not deliberately uh, trying to avoid field goal attempts because of the struggles. In fact, the opposite, we'd like to kick our way into some really solid kicking game as soon as possible. Okay, special teams players of the week from Liberty. Uh, yeah, at the top rock award for the top coverage players, I uh, thought Carter Krupp and Tanner Wall did a really nice job on kickoff. Those guys have been solid all year long. Uh, the top blocks went to Keanu Hill and Ethan Erickson, who did a nice job on kickoff return. Hobbs Nyberg had one really nice kickoff return. Uh, we had two other kickoff returns in the game, but they were off of squib kicks, and it's, it's hard to get something going sometimes when, when those squib kicks are kicked like that. Uh, but Ethan and Keanu did a really nice job. And then Caden Haas is just a, he's a model of consistency, and that's what we need right now. From our team, the, le- the biggest leadership guys for our team right now are guys that just go out, quietly do their job, regardless of score. Mm-hmm. They do it well, and, and our team is in desperate need right now of that uh, from from our coaching staff and our our players on the field. Okay, kudos to those guys. Time again for a break. When we come back, closing comments from Coach Ed Lamb. As we break, we remind you that for your daily Cougar Sports play-by-play, tune in weekdays to BYU Sports Nation at noon Eastern time on BYU TV and BYU Radio. You're in the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Closing comments with Coach Lamb are coming up right after this. Coordinator's Corner on BYU TV is brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys, Built Bar, Fuel the Journey, and by Siegfried and Jensen, helping Utah families for over 30 years. Wrapping it up on the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys with BYU Special Teams Coordinator, Safeties Coach, and Assistant Head Coach Ed Lamb. BYU home to ECU this Friday night at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. And the Pirates, 5-3 and three and confident they've won 3-4. of four. Big rivalry win on the weekend and uh, pretty potent on offense and disruptive on defense. Very much so. A very athletic team. We found that out uh, a few years ago. I think it was 2017 uh, 17 when we went back there. And uh, we, we weren't having a very good year that year. Um, but they were uh, they weren't either, and their athleticism was really difficult to deal with on, on that day. That's what they've that's what they've just done really well over the years. They've got a lot of length, a lot of speed, very aggressive in their systems of offense and defense. Well, as always, as I mentioned with Coach Roderick, appreciate your perspective on helping us break down what did happen, and uh, we hope uh, better things happen for you and the boys this weekend. We'll talk with it uh, talk about it with you next Monday, Coach. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. All right, that'll do it for week nine of the Coordinator's Corner. For coaches Roderick and Lamb, my name is Greg Grubel. Thank you for joining us today here in Studio C at BYU TV. Have a great week, and go Cougs.